Marcus and today I'm going to be sharing with you guys how to achieve professional level GoPro quality out of any GoPro that you might have. Let's begin with our settings. It's important that you understand why you would choose a certain setting and I'm going to go through them but they are on the screen right now if you do not have the time to check them all out. Everything that I'm going to talk about today is going to be in the description as well so if you want to check out some of the topics you can go down in the description and Check the timestamps below. Frame rates are a very subjective thing. The most important part about picking a frame rate is going to be picking the same frame rate for your project settings in the editing software. This is to prevent something called a pull down or a pull up. And you can read more about that if you're interested. Resolutions are a very easy choice, to be honest. If you're shooting anything that should be as a POV, uh, shot. Simply use 16 by 9 with super view. If you're shooting anything that's not on your body, then don't use super view and use 4x3 instead. 4x3 uses the same amount of sensor size as the 16x9 uh, in super view, but you get the chance to rescale it after. Super view is a compressed 4x3 format and it's not really very pleasant unless you're shooting POV style videos with your camera on your head or your body. Let's talk a little bit about uh, stabilization and to add on to the last point about cropping of the sensor when you use hypersmooth it crops a little bit in on the footage as well so you're going to get reduced perception of speed just from the crop as well as from the stabilization so if you're going for a very speedy look uh, and you're for example you're skiing where there's not too many bumps when riding I wouldn't bother using hypersmooth at all. I would just completely skip that step and go no stabilization on skiing. When you're shooting mountain biking, uh, it's a lot more bumpy than when you're skiing. So I always use uh, hypersmooth when I'm mountain biking. Although it's a crop, uh, you can get a lot of the, the handlebars in the frame if you use a chin mount or a chest mount. There is a myth about hypersmooth where people think that hypersmooth doesn't work in low light and. Uh, that is actually completely incorrect. The only thing that depends on whether hypersmooth works or not is shutter speed. If you have a shutter of over uh, 1 one hundredth of a second or more, it's going to work perfectly fine as shown in this clip. And this is also why I use everything on manual because my hypersmooth is always going to work uh, regardless of the light in the frame. So it's a very nice segue into shutter speed from uh, stabilization. Now here comes the problem with using a manual shutter. GoPros do not have aperture, they cannot regulate the aperture, so the only way to reduce exposure is through the shutter speed. If you use a shutter of let's say 1 100th in the middle of the day, everything is going to be overexposed. So you have to use these ND filters. Some filters that I got from China, um, for really cheap, like $30. You can get some really expensive ones from Polo Pro, for example, but I wouldn't bother buying the most expensive ones, at least in the beginning when you're just learning. This is an ND32. It's basically blocking five stops of light. So when I'm skiing, I use a ND32 filter. And when I'm out uh, mountain biking and it's a normal sunny day, I use an ND16. And when it's an overcast day and I'm mountain biking, for example, I might use an ND8. Oh, oh, oh. Oi.
Let's talk a bit about uh, GoPro Color. There are three different settings now. There are GoPro Color, GoPro Neutral, and GoPro Flat Color. The flat profile is the one I always use because it has more color information, more uh, luminance information to use in posts. GoPro Color is a very saturated and contrasty uh, color profile, which is created, I believe, to help with the compression on Instagram, Facebook and YouTube. You can see that the, the shadows are completely crushed into the blacks to prevent the compression from really hitting those areas at all. But the thing you're sacrificing then is that the information is permanently lost, that you can't work with it in post. So you have less room to mess up your exposure. So always use flat color if you're going to process the image in post-production. When it comes to ISO and EV compensation, I always use minimum and maximum 100 ISO. This is because I want to lock the ISO and use everything on manual to do my exposure. Most people will tell you to use a EV compensation of negative 0.5 or negative 1.0. This is true and it's very good if you're not using a manual ISO and shutter. For white balance, uh, it's very simple. Try to match the white balance as well as you can to the live scene that you're in. If you want to do this the simple way, just open up the settings Take a look at the white balance on the screen, make sure that the, the white balance matches the scene and then use that white balance. Don't ever use native white balance, it's too much red and with the color depth and the bit rate of the GoPros, you're not going to be able to push much back uh, without sacrificing image quality. Most of the time I'm shooting in 5500 Kelvin because it's daylight, uh, it's the closest to daylight and it's usually working very nice way to produce uh, natural looking colors. When it comes to sharpening, um, in-camera sharpening, it's really the work of the devil. So try to avoid anything else than low or medium. Now to my favorite and least favorite topic of all, the audio. This is probably the most important step of getting your footage to be extra uh, crispy and extra nice. And it's also the most neglected usually. For audio, I have created my own uh, little uh, GoPro hood from a sweater, which I put over my camera and that reduces the wind noise by a lot. Like this. Very cute, with small, small ears on the side. Now, if you really want to make it really professional, you can buy an external recorder like this. The Edge one and Zoom, as I have here, it cost me $100, very cheap, very high quality. You can connect it to a lav microphone and then put it on your chest or whatever it fits to produce much higher quality audio than the in-camera audio. Let's hop into DaVinci Resolve 17, which is my editing software of choice. DaVinci Resolve is the perfect editing software for pretty much anyone because it is free. First thing we want to do is go into our project settings and check that our frame rate is correct. So right here, I have already decided that my frame rate is going to be 29.97 frames per second, which is the same as my footage. So click save and create your timeline. After you click create, it should be the same settings as your project settings. Okay, now we're ready to begin editing. After you've imported your clips and edited your timeline, you're ready to begin grading. So let's move on to the color grading tab. It looks like this and it's quite intimidating at first. Um, right here we can see down in the bottom right we have our scopes. And if we want to expand this, these tools are our visualizations of what is happening in the image. So right now in this image, I can see that there are pretty much only highlights. Uh, everything that is being shown is around 800 to 650 nits. And this is the lighting conditions. Anything above 1023 nits is completely white and it's not possible to recover. Anything below zero is also impossible to recover. So this is why I want to expose your image correctly 
when you're out in the field, because if you're messing up the exposure, you're losing information to edit with in post-production. Okay, so what do we have to do when we begin editing? Well, we have to first we can go to our nodes, and then we're going to color correct the image. So, our first node is going to be our color correction. And this pretty much means get your white balance correct and your tint, as well as your exposure. Those three things are the main things we're going to fix in this first node. I can tell by this image that it's quite uh, warm. When you're on a uh, glacier, it's usually a lot colder. The light isn't that yellow, so we're going to see if we could just cool off the image slightly. And this, to me, this looks uh, completely perfect. Uh, maybe change the tint slightly, and that looks good. And it is truly that simple. Now for the exposure, we can either change your exposure through the curves or through the primaries down here. I'm going to do both. First, I'm going to do the curves with this uh, footage here, and then I'm going to do primaries with this one. So let's see if we can make this image look a little bit more natural. I'm going to up the highlights slightly to around 920 nits because this is snow and snow is usually pretty bright in real life as well. Now we're going to lower our gamma a little bit to get more contrast in the snow. And then maybe smoothen out this bottom bit, the, the shadows as well. And to me, this looks like a very balanced image. Go through the footage and check that it looks fine. Yeah, looks pretty good. Might be able to add a little bit more contrast in the shadows. And that looks pretty good to me. Okay, let's color correct our second image. And to me, this might look a little bit green. Um, and slightly red in the shadows as well. You can see on the vector scope here on the parades that it's uh, predominantly green but try not to get misled by the parades uh, when you're out mountain biking most of the things you're going to be seeing are maybe green or brown anyway so it's fine that the image uh, dominantly shows green and red colors on the scopes when we're skiing it's kind of the opposite and maybe blue is the main dominant color you don't have to try to get the parades to be exactly on the same line by doing something like uh, maybe like this does look a lot more balanced now but the image looks completely destroyed I'm going to check it out and see if we can make it a little bit it looks really good already to be honest um, I'm going to remove a little bit of green and that helps a lot with the image. So now I'm in the offset bar here and I'm just taking out some green from the main image. Not too much because that leaves me with too much red and blue, but a little bit to make it a little bit more pleasing. And I can also notice that I'm actually working in the wrong node. I'm working in the second node. So I'm just gonna change that to my color correction node. Um, and uh, now for the exposure, let's do it through our primaries. I feel like this image is really well balanced already and there's not really much I can do to it. I can add a little bit of contrast by bringing down the lows a little bit and then maybe bringing up the highlights slightly. I'm going to go through the clip and see how it changes for me. So it stays pretty much the even the whole way through, which means uh, that I can stick with one exposure and be happy with it. So for me this looks good. This looks like a balanced image. I'd say that this looks quite normal and good. So now we are ready to begin our creative process. And our creative process has to happen in the second node after our color corrections. If you want to learn more about color management, uh, I'm going to link some videos in the description, but I'm not going to go into detail about that now because it's very complicated. So for your creative grading, there's a lot of different things you can do. But mostly, I would suggest staying away from the temperature and the tint. Use your gain, your gamma, your lift, your offset, and you can use your curves through the different hue versus hue. This is pretty much just changing the color wheels on your vector scope. So this is pretty much all your colors in the color wheel. And you can shift them around to make them look more fancy. 
this looks completely crazy so try not to overdo it but you can do small adjustments like for example I can mark this uh, ground here by holding down and clicking on the screen itself this marks the red part and I might want to change it to more brown color which feels more natural to a mountain biker so let's rotate the hue see if we can yeah that looks more normal so it's not a big change but it's slightly better uh, also you can see that the most color information in this shot is right here around the yellows so the biggest change in this image is going to come from changing this part now let's try to do that now you can see that you can change the color almost to sort of like a autumn color to make it look like it's late in the in the fall and I'm doing it extremely much so you can see my bike is changing color as well so this is my uh, tip to you guys don't overdo the hue changes they are very apparent to our eyes but a little bit is fine and you can you can make it a little bit fancier and now we can compare our pre-image to our post image by clicking this button right here and you can see that I've changed it to a lot more pleasant color just in three minutes so I'm happy with that I'm not going to do much more and I'm going to call this image for finished as of now um, let's move on to our second image which is a skiing clip we have already color corrected this by doing this if you click the numbers on the nodes you can activate or deactivate a certain node so this is what we have done to the image we have completely color corrected it and made it, made it look a lot more normal uh, now for the creative grade I'm going to do something a bit different I'm not going to do it manually I'm going to cheat a little bit I'm going to use my lookup tables or my LUTs now uh, DaVinci Resolve has some LUTs from uh, some stock LUTs but there are possible LUTs out there uh, that you can find and create your own looks as well uh, most of these LUTs it's worth noting that they're made to be used in a different color space or a different gamma. Now this means that we have to change the gamma or the color space of our footage first if we want to use them. GoPro color space is a Rec 709 color space and it's the most common color space uh, and colorful color space as well. It's uh, mainly used on most screens, most cell phones, most uh, monitors and most consumer cameras as well. So we're going to change our gamma now to Cineon uh, film log, which these LUTs in the film looks require. So now these LUTs are going to work correctly. So you can drag on the LUT onto the node after this transform to add it to the layer after. So now this LUT works completely correct. The one issue with these LUTs however is that they are very harsh on the highlights so they are completely removing almost all the contrast in the snow which doesn't look good as a skier. This particular LUT looks pretty nice so I'm going to choose that by either double clicking or dragging it over. And now we might want to make some adjustments to the clip itself by dragging the, the highlights down a bit and creating some more contrast. And that looks pretty good. So now we have used a LUT. Because this is the color space transformed to another gamma, I'm also going to make this a compound node to make them work correctly together. So now we can change the strength of this LUT by going down to our key output and changing the gain. As you can see on the screen, it's changing how much the lookup table affects the image. And I want to use it, maybe that much looks nice. Not too much yellow. It still looks like the original image, but slightly changed. That looks good to me. Let's say you want to use a normal LUT that's not a different color space. You can just use a LUT that is already Rec 709. This Liverpool LUT looks really good. It's quite strong, but that's fine. So we can decrease the LUT strength in our key section here. Go to the key uh, output and remove some of the gain to make it look more normal. That looks very nice to me. And now we can compare the pre-image to the post-image by clicking this button again. And you can see the major change that has happened here. It looks a lot better 
Uh, you can also look on the parade. Then we have shifted the image slightly up and expanded some of the contrast in the lows. So this looks very good. And this is pretty much how I do all my color grading. I usually use the ruts because I don't, I can't really be bothered to use it uh, to make a manual uh, grade for all my grades. Um, so I just use LUTs most of the time and it ends up being very nice. I'd also like to make a point about uh, compression because YouTube has a very harsh compression if you don't use a specific codec. Now to get the VP9 codec, which is the most powerful and high quality codec on YouTube, you want to upload in above 1440p. Simply change your timeline, if you have uh, different timeline settings, to anything that is above 1440p. So for instance, that is for example 2560 uh, by 1440. Anything above this is going to get the VP9 codec from YouTube. So if I upload in 4K, I can change the resolution. Now our timeline is in 4K and we can also export in MP4 uh, 4K with high quality uh, image. And this is going to become the best possible YouTube quality that you can get. So that is my process for editing and creating nice colors in DaVinci Resolve. Use these tips and you might get some really nice results yourself as well. Uh, please like the video if you enjoyed it and leave a comment if there's something you're wondering about. There's very many things I didn't uh, touch on in this video. So leave your comment below if you have any questions about anything in the process. Uh, please subscribe if you want to see more of these uh, kinds of videos. And uh, thank you to my patrons as well for supporting me. I'll see you guys in another video. Bye.